One little malicious compliance cost the company a fortune. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, do nothing but chores and school. My mother is abusive. I'm not debating with the comments. This is a fact of my life. She doesn't act in my interest unless it benefits her or makes her look better. She goes through the motions of being a good parent and puts in no effort to back it up. She yells at me nonstop and refuses to acknowledge me as her son. So a little earlier in the school year, I got a couple D's and missed a lot of days because she refused to drive me when I missed the bus. Yes, making the bus is my responsibility, but I'm also disabled and struggle to make it out on time. I'd make it early if she were to drive me when I missed the bus. So she said, until you get good grades, you'll do nothing but chores and school, OP. So I did nothing but that. I didn't speak to her. I didn't leave my room. I didn't do art. I did not write. I gray rocked so hard you think I was the most uninteresting rock in a gravel pile. Mom got concerned when my grades still didn't improve, saying she thinks I'd do better if I went back to doing art. In front of the school counselor, of course. So I say deadpan, you said nothing but school and chores. I did nothing but school and chores. I'm still on my BS with this, actually. I do my art in my room and I don't show her. I stare blankly at her when she speaks to me. Careful what you wish for, ma'am. I take instructions literally. Sadly, I think this is kind of a common coping mechanism to deal with overbearing, narcissistic parents like this. You basically act like a soulless zombie around them because otherwise you show any kind of emotion and they're somehow going to twist that into some blow up. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, please cut open the Hershey eggs. Okay. This one is minor compared to some of the others I see on this thread, but I figured I'd share it anyway. A few years ago, my dad asked me to retrieve an unopened bag of Hershey eggs for him and open it with scissors. I don't know why, but I was feeling extra malicious that day, so I did as I was asked. Instead of cutting the end of the bag, I cut off the side of the bag, making it virtually impossible to store them in the bag. I then took them to my dad and presented him with his request. He had no response as he knew he hadn't specified which way to open the bag, while my mom was next to him crying from laughter. I later saw the Hershey eggs in a Tupperware in the candy drawer. Victory! This next story is, I'm required to make you coffee? Okay. I've been reading these malicious compliance posts and lamenting that I have nothing to share when I remembered my own story from when I was a young airman first class stationed at Davis Montham AFB in Tucson, Arizona back in 1997-98 working the graveyard shift midnight to 7 a.m. as an AGE mechanic. At the time, I wasn't a coffee drinker and had never even made a cup in my life, important for the story. In fact, my first cup wasn't until about 2004 when I was a staff sergeant stationed at Cannon AFB in New Mexico and have been hooked ever since. On to the story, I was assigned to a combat AGE team, CAT, the folks that support all flight line equipment, and our boss was a master sergeant that was known for being a real jerk for no reason. He was a chain smoker and a caffeine addict. One day at the end of my shift, he calls me into the office and wants to know why there's no coffee in the coffee pot when he came in. I informed him that I don't drink coffee, so I have no reason to make it. He tells me when he comes in the next day that there had better be a full pot waiting for him, and every day after too. I told him I had never made coffee, to which he dismissed me with a barking order to have coffee made for him. Now, it's important to note that while he was my master sergeant, the military or the air force at least frowns on sergeants using airmen as their personal gophers in this way. Cue malicious compliance. That night I asked the shift sergeant how to make coffee. He asks, what do I mean? It's so simple. Filter, grounds, water, airmen, seriously? He also asks why I need to know, as I don't drink this stuff. I tell him and he informs me that the master sergeant can't order me to make it, but I say it's no problem really. Well, I do what I'm told. A full pot, right? So 12 cups water in the maker, filter in the holder, but how much grounds? Well, I figure the pot was full of water, so the filter must have to be full with coffee, right? I filled that filter to the top, packed it down a bit, and filled it up again. Just before the first shift came in, 
I turn it on and wait. From outside the shop, I see Master Sergeant come in, see the coffee, and grin the poop-eating grin he was known for, pour himself a full cup, he took it black, and take a good hearty swig and spew it straight back out all over the table and floor. I watched him clean it up, take the pot and pour it out and look at the filter with a look on his face that clearly said, that stupid airman. When I walked in after I stopped laughing and crying, he called me over and told me I was never allowed to make coffee again for life. Now I own a coffee maker that grinds its own beans and I've become a bit of a coffee snob. So I can only imagine how terrible the concoction I made tasted all those years ago. I'm just assuming, considering how much grounds OP put in there, that when they took that big hearty swig, they didn't just get liquid, they got a nice chunk of grounds in their drink as well. Our next story is, Boss griped at the idea of me slipping out of work 5 minutes early to get to an appointment on time. Said I'd need to use a sick or personal day, so I did. For background, my old boss used to be more flexible. As long as we got our tasks done, if something came up and we needed to slip out a few minutes early, they never had much of an issue. I rarely took advantage of it, but if I had to, I always made sure to make up those few minutes elsewhere. This new boss comes along and is such a micromanager and control freak. Now, we're not allowed to even be a minute late or leave a minute early. We actually need to put in for PTO, either for a half or full day just to be able to slip out a few minutes early. I had an appointment one day and offered to work through my break time just to leave a few minutes early. Boss balked at the idea. I arranged ahead of time for the whole personal day off. I booked myself a massage and went out to lunch before my appointment. Boss wasn't happy with me taking a personal day, especially since we're currently short-staffed, but I did follow their policy. I just don't understand why these people are like, Ugh, you can't leave five minutes early. They must be siblings with those teachers you had growing up where they say, The bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you, you gotta wait till I say you can leave. Our next story is a bee sting in a fire truck. When entitlement turns to embarrassment. In college, I worked at the front desk for a dorm. Most of the time it was a chill job. I worked nights and just had to help the occasional drunk student after they lost their keys. However, once a year, we had to deal with the worst of the worst. Move out. Anyone that's ever experienced move out day knows the absolute crap show it is. During move out, the supervisors scheduled double the people at the front desk, so I had to work during the day. Our front desk was in the main community space for the dorms. Out front of the space was a super small lane that led to the parking garage. Everyone that needed to get to the parking garage had to use this lane. My whole shift was going fairly well, just small complaints about moving bins and our lack of resources for the summer heat. So far so good, or so I thought. Up comes this family, a mom, dad, and daughter that were clearly annoyed. My three other co-workers were busy, so it was up to me to help this family. I said, hi, what can I help you with? The mom in a snippy tone says, I was stung by a bee. I need some medical assistance. Now, as a student worker, the last thing I was allowed to do was provide medical care of any kind. Couldn't even hand out a band-aid. Knowing I can't help, I reply, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. As a desk worker, I'm not able to provide medical assistance, but the daughter cuts me off impatiently. You don't even have a first aid kit? Can't you just give us something to help? I would have assumed they were worried about the mom's health, but at this point they sounded more upset that they weren't getting their way. I said we don't have first aid kits because I'm not allowed to administer aid. If you'd like to get help, I would recommend walking over to health services. The daughter, sounding progressively more entitled and annoyed, you want us to walk all the way over to health services? At this point, all I wanted was for them to leave, but I couldn't say that. I said there's also an urgent care and hospital right off campus if you're worried about a reaction. The mom says, I'm not driving all the way over to a hospital, I just need help now. Can you call someone for help or something? Cue the malicious compliance. Normally I would call our non-emergency number for assistance, but this family clearly wanted quality care. I said, would you like me to call 911? I can see if they'll help. She says, yes, do something. So I call 911. The operator asks about the emergency and I explain it's a bee sting. 
The operator says, are they allergic? I ask the mom and she says, well, no, but it's hurting. They say, do they have tweezers they could use to pull out the stinger? I ask the family and to this the daughter snaps, why would we have tweezers? Of course we don't have tweezers, what kind of question is that? I relayed the message to the operator and let her know the family specifically requested medical care. She sighed, clearly annoyed by this non-emergency and let me know she sent help. At this point my line is getting incredibly long, so I ask the family to step to the side. When I tell them help is on the way, the mom asks, what are they sending? I said, I don't know. She says, well, I hope it's not a fire truck. That would be so embarrassing for just a bee sting. A few minutes go by, and I can tell the mom is starting to realize she may have overreacted. She tries to tell her family that they can just leave, but the dad and daughter remind her that they're already sending someone. As they wait, up comes a massive fire truck, sirens blaring. All the other families at the front desk, which is a lot because this family held up a line, turn to see what's going on. The mom is absolutely mortified. She's looking around, trying to hide behind her family. It's hilarious. She meets emergency services outside so they don't make a big scene in front of the other families. The best part? The fire truck had to stop in the teeny tiny lane out front of our community center, completely blocking the way into the parking garage. This means a line of cars was building up while she got her bee sting treated. With each car joining the line, she looked more and more embarrassed. Once she was treated, they came back in to get to the daughter's dorm. They walked quickly and avoided eye contact, clearly embarrassed by the overreaction. I hope they've learned to stop with the impatience and entitlement. As much as I hate calling 911 for trivial things, It was worth it to see the look of sheer humiliation on the mom's face, and I'd like to think the operator was looking out for me and fulfilling my malicious compliances to the highest degree. Honestly, I'm surprised that the operator would send somebody out, and honestly, I'm surprised that they're treating it so seriously when they got there. This next story is not 5 minutes early, but 10 minutes late, and it cost them a fortune. My friend Bobby was a CNC machinist. A good one, and the only one. The company he worked for made an intricate product and his CNC part was crucial. The rest of the product bolted onto it. The finished product sold for tens of thousands of dollars. It took three hours to make this piece. Bobby would make three a day. He'd make one in the morning, take his coffee break, then make another and take his lunch break. That ate up about 6.75 hours. He would stay late to make the third part and make two hours overtime. His new foreman turned out to be a bit more of a jerk. He tried to get Bobby to do other tasks and Bobby said no, as he needed to monitor the CNC machine during all stages of the cycle. The foreman witched to the plant manager who told him to back off and leave Bobby alone. One day there was a bad snowstorm and Bobby was 10 minutes late. The foreman was there to greet him at the time clock with a poop eating grin on his face holding a demerit slip. Bobby had clocked in a minute late the previous week, and the union rules said that if you were late twice, within 14 days, you got 20 demerit points. Bobby and Foreman got into a bit of an animated conversation, and the union steward came over and said that Bobby had no choice but to take the demerit hit. So Bobby went to work. His shift was 8am to 4.30pm, but he usually stayed until 6.30 to finish the last part. Not today. At 4.30, he shut the machine down and headed for the door. The next morning, Foreman comes over and says that the assembly team is short apart. He says, yeah, I know, I'm working on it right now. It'll be done in two hours. They say, but they need three a day. Why didn't you make three of them yesterday? He says, because my shift is over at 4.30 and I went home. They said, what? You stay every night until the third part is finished. Bobby pulled the demerit slip out of his shirt pocket looked the foreman in the eye and said, not anymore. Bobby had done the math. Every week, instead of getting 15 parts, they were getting 10 or 11. The foreman tried to sweep it under the rug, but within a few days, chaos ensued. The assemblers had no core part, and their team went to the plant manager to let him know that production was failing. The assemblers liked it. They got to hang around yakking while they waited for the next CNC part to arrive. Eventually, there was a meeting with plant manager, foreman, union steward, and Bobby. Foreman tried to throw Bobby under the bus, saying that he refused overtime. 
The union steward pointed out that as per the contract, mandatory overtime was only in case of emergencies. And this wasn't an emergency. Bobby had every right to decline the OT. The foreman lost his temper, started yelling at Bobby and the union steward, and was asked to leave the meeting. Plant manager knew he was screwed and looked at Bobby and asked, What's it going to take to get you to work the overtime? Bobby smiled and replied, As long as foreman is my supervisor, I won't be working a minute of OT. And that was the last anyone saw foreman. By sticking to the contract, Bobby cost the company a handful of parts worth many thousands of dollars and put the company into a position where their lowered production would cost them even more in perpetuity. Bobby worked a couple of Saturdays to catch up and made double time for those shifts. They hired a new foreman who was explicitly instructed, do not, under any circumstances, mess with Bobby. I think you just gotta revel in the fact that you do such good work and you are so important that you know if somebody messes with you, you can get them into heaps of trouble real quick. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.